Evening, Artie. Oh, just going. How are you? I'm doing good. Excellent. So I, I, I um, I'm, I'm eating uh, the pine stuff. Pine cones. Is, anyways, is that what they do up yeah. there? Now, do you, you have a good, um, do you have a good flagship store there? A good brick and mortar store where you're at? So there's probably at least two stores that I've never set foot in. So um, where, are, where are you again? I'm in Columbus, Ohio. So you're close to Maryland, aren't you? Mm, we're about six hours from Maryland. We went oh, to okay. Maryland for uh, winter offensive last year. Yeah. It was just okay. like a month before that the whole country shut down. And uh, that's about six hours. So All we're right. not terribly close. We're closer to, well, maybe, maybe as the crow flies, we're closer to you. That's possible. There's a, several lakes in the way, however. Jesus, Jesus, Trevor, Trevor, I, Trevor, Trevor. Is, Tre is he causing trouble again? Yeah. How can we ban him, like from the internet? But that is, well, you know what? I think I, I, I've been talking about kickstarting. We have a Kickstarter for a device that will let you punch people over the internet. And I'm going to kickstart it for a billion dollars, <laughs> and I will get it. <laughs> Hey, we have uh, go on with the store. You said yeah, two stores. So yeah, so there's the soldiery, which has been around basically forever, and there's the guard tower, which now has two locations, which has also been around basically forever, and those are both quite good card and board game stores. Um, neither one is a particularly strong store for RPGs, and neither store is per even that strong for war games. But both oh. of those stores do sell some war games, yeah, right? Look at their names, man. Look at the names. Well, yeah, but don't forget, they've been around forever when uh, the soldiery used to do a lot of historical miniatures, for example. That's that's where they got the name from. And the guard tower, I think, kind of started as an RPG place, I think. Hey, beat. But I was not uh, I was not in Columbus at the time, so I wouldn't know. Um, there's a place called the Tin Soldier in Dayton, which I don't know if that's still around anymore or not. I was last in there in about 1994. So might might well be gone. Um, there's a place called the Bookery in Date, also in Dayton, which is a much better gaming store. But, but again, last time I was in there was like 10, 12 years ago. So who knows? I don't know. Uh, I'm, trying and, look, I'm trying to take a look at on the net and uh, now the the store with the best, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about you know why people say you should support your local gaming store, right? So Cleveland's about two and a half hours from here. It's about two and a half hour drive. Uh, there's a store called the Warzone Matrix in Cleveland, just north of the airport, Cleveland Hopkins, the big airport, um, that has more war games in stock than any all the other st Ohio stores that I've been in combined. What's it called again? Warzone Matrix. And I... Uh, they have a website, but I don't think they do online sales. I could be wrong about that. And uh, how are their prices? Uh, a lot of their stuff is older stuff, and is is they, their prices are not like top dollar prices, but they're not like bargain basement. Gets yourself a sealed copy of Flat Top for twenty bucks either. So yeah, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for Tokyo Express. Tokyo, that's good. That is going to cost some money. I'm afraid. <sighs> Yeah, Trevor, Trevor, do you have uh, Trevor Just here? Do you have Tokyo Express that I can buy off you for like a 20 bucks or something? Yeah, for sure he's not going to answer. But here, I'll show you. <laughs> That's a good way to shut him up. Yeah. Uh, I'll show you the store we have here in Montreal, which is amazing. It's, it's, uh, it's a thing of beauty, man. It's called the... the the uh, the Joker Hearts there, and okay. French, Le Valet de Coeur, and uh, hold on, yeah, and this is just this is their war gaming uh, section, as you can see, all this all the all the stuff is up here, right? Right. And you see the prices? Ah, uh, they don't see uh, those are U.S. dollars. No, those are Canadian dollars. Well, why do they have a little U.S. flag next to them then? Or does that just mean it's like no, an American that means game? It's in England, yeah, because I can. I can um, hold on. Oh, okay. So it's not a francophone game. No, I just... they have those. You could get those, but I think you have to get them from France. So no, you can get it from Montreal. 
Well, publisher wise, I know Hexasim does stuff in French, and uh, those other French guys. <laughs> well, there's in, in Montreal. There's a place called Philosophia. Okay. Which are which um like they'll they'll take a game from GMT uh, on license and print mm -hmm. it in English in, in English or in French, I in should French. say. It's already in English. That must yeah, be yeah, the cheapest yeah. license uh, anywhere. So you see already these prices. Look for what remains uh fifty nine ninety nine. So that's sixty bucks Canadian. So that minus thirty percent your uh -huh. money, and uh -huh. they ship for five bucks. Okay. Shipping is five bucks. I have within Canada though. I don't I ask me. You. Do not yes. blame me for the U.S. Postal Service's crazy prices to do anything. Five bucks. So. So I'm sure that if they have, uh, shipping at five bucks Canadian, I'm sure they must uh, have bleeding hearts for the states or something. You know what I'm saying? Uh, may, uh, maybe, I don't know. I've never ordered any. I don't think I've ever ordered a war game from Canada. Why would you? I have from Europe. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's worth it, right? If it's a super expensive. So somebody, I forget, I and I didn't buy this. Somebody was selling, I can't remember what it was now, a, a game that runs about 150 bucks. And they wanted, I think, 40 or 50 bucks to ship it, but it was in France, right? Well, you know, if you're paying right. 150 bucks, then maybe... Maybe forty or fifty bucks to ship is not too bad. Well, I have no idea what French right. postal rates either. Yeah. So well, I mean, you know, if it's if it's across an ocean, I can understand why it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. I could have I could have driven that package up to you <laughs> for probably not in much more time than it took me to drive to Connecticut. And uh, yeah, probably. So, and and, and, and the hotel would have been better. Fast. And the food probably would have been better too. Now that I think about it, of course. Of course, you know, look at that flying colors deluxe. The one you gave me was the this is the third that's edition. That's the last printing. Yeah. This is the uh, you gave me the second edition, right? Oh, uh, I think it's the second, yeah. Yeah, so take off 10 bucks. That's how much that game cost. Canadian. And and they have a lot of they victus. Uh, sure, of, French language. Yeah, at least of, available of, in French. I mean, it's it's a French company, so. Yeah, and hold on a second. Let me see. I had a page, all page of Vevictas there. Boom. <clears throat> there's a, a so there's a a series of more or less anyway tactical or grand tactical Napoleonics games called Jour de Gloire that uh, came out of a Richard Berg game system actually and was evolved from there. And and many of those games, of which there are a lot appeared in Vevictus. Richard Berg, eh? Mm -hmm. the, um, Berg, the Berg game is called Triumph and Glory. And I think I think there were might have been two games in the series, two boxes anyway. I think it was more than one more than one battle in one of them. One was Borodino and the other one was Triumph and Glory, which had I think three or five battles or something like that in it. Talking about Berg, did you ever meet Berg? No, no, I, you know, and I, it's too bad because nah. I was at, I mean, I've seen like pictures of here's Richard Berg at Origins 97. I was at Origins 97. I did not go out of my way to meet Richard Berg at the time, which is too bad. Yeah. At that time, other than maybe John Hill, uh, he was, and, and maybe like Jim Dunnigan, uh, he was probably the only war game designer whose like work I was making a point to check out. What about um, Mark, what about Mark Herman? Uh, Mark Herman was not on my radar back in the early night, early midnight, mid mid to late nineties. Actually, I mean, I was aware of Mark Herman. Don't get me wrong, but uh, but a lot of Mark Herman, I've, and I've told this story. A lot of Mark's game designs came out during the Victory Games period, and the people I was gaming with at the time up in Cleveland were not fans of Victory Games. So it's it's a lot of that stuff we just didn't touch, and you know, stuff like Empire of the Sun wasn't even out yet. Do you know this guy, Omoludens? Yeah, that's Fred. That's Fred. <clears throat> and Fred, Fred right now resides in... I'm in, so, so sorry. In I'm the sorry. English country of, uh, of England. Of, of England. <laughs> I'm sorry, because the English country of England is has English food. It has English that, food. That you must endure those crimes against... And, and this guy, and this guy's a Frenchy man, so he's going. Oh, he's got to be. I, he, it's, he's got to be. He's like, ah, roast beef, ah, uh, all the time. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm starting a thing with him, uh, uh, Ace of Aces. And uh, do you have any shell shading, uh, shell cell shading software that 
you can tell me about. No, I, I mean, I, uh, I, so my graphics programs that I use are, uh, Inkscape, which is a vector graphics program and child, Justin, um, and GIMP, which is a raster graphics program. That's kind of an equivalent to Photoshop, right? Whereas Inkscape is more an equivalent to Adobe Illustrator. Uh, Photoshop is super powerful. I can't, and and GIMP has is powerful as well. And I personally can do a like one half of one percent of the shit that GIMP can do. Uh, I'm a, quite a bit better with um, Inkscape, but I'm you know not, I'm not drawing or anything. It's I'm just you know manipulating images in in most cases that I'm putting together myself. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm I. We want to try to pull a Stuka Joe, but uh, I have the... done actual sp video slides using Inkscape rather than using PowerPoint, um, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> a lot of people use PowerPoint, actually. I don't um, even know what PowerPoint is. I work on a Mac. It's the well, you can get PowerPoint for a Mac. It's the yeah, yeah. Microsoft suite. Office. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the Office thing for presentations, and really, I mean, it's nice because you could do. It's powerful too. I mean, it's it's the standard for presentations. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit I'm gonna hit the chat here, and I'm gonna hit John John Longshore. John, where do you live? And talk to me about a, a brick and mortar store in your area. John lives in Michigan, unfortunately, where the food is almost as bad as in London. But he said he's retired from from customs. I thought he was retired from Canadian customs. Uh, not that, not that he's told me, but Canada doesn't care. But don't bring any weapons or too much alcohol. Entering the United States is different. Yes, of course. So funny story. I got a funny. I got a lot of funny stories. So uh, this was quite a while ago, over ten years ago. Now I was working for an auto, auto, a auto parts supplier for General Motors that I will not name. So they sent me to Mexico. A couple of times, but this one trip they sent me to Mexico, the plant was in Nuevo Laredo, and they said, look, it's just going to be way easier if you get a hotel in Laredo, Texas, and just drive back and forth across the border every day. No! no, no. So you drive you drive <laughs> into, you, you, you get you get up, get, get breakfast, you get in the rental car, you drive across the border, here's what happens. You're driving, you drive across a bridge, there's a 16-year-old kid with the machine gun, he waves at you, you wave back, and off you go. That's Seriously. getting into Mexico. Coming back into the United States every night was somewhere between two and five hours waiting at at, uh, at the border. Yeah. And this would have been at about 2005, something like that. Something like that. You're serious about the kid with yeah. the machine gun? Hey, what's up, man? Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I, yeah, you know, I'm exaggerating for dramatic effect, but only slightly. Uh, I got some uh, Beat Cafe uh, uh, Canva. I th I'm going to take a look at that. Let me take this down. I think I already saw it, uh, Beat. <laughs> if we're talking about, like, software at an actual talented artist would use, then I no, am the no, wrong no, person no, to ask. No, no, I don't want no learning curve. No learning curve. So GIMP, learning curve. Photoshop, yeah, learning curve. Absolutely. And Inkscape, uh, I just use it. I use it for so much stuff. I use it for all my like little thumbnails and stuff, and and I use it for uh, maps and plates and all kinds of stuff. Super, super, super useful program for me for what I do. But cell shading, you're 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 already speaking a foreign language, so well, cell shading isn't there a filter? I just drop it down and it's cell shaded. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you know what I'm saying. That's that's, a... that's plausible. I don't know. Uh, uh, do you? Uh, I haven't uh, taken an art class since grade school. I did not take art in high school. You're lucky you went to grade school. But anyway, yeah. let's not talk about that. <laughs> we always get off the bloody subject, and it's my fault. That's okay. RIW hey, so Hobbies in Livonia, Michigan. More war games than expected, but really nice. Yeah, so the, the local... So here's the thing. People say support your local game store. And, and I agree with that generally, but let's you know be realistic. And most people's local game store probably don't sell war games. Maybe they sell other types of games like RPGs or miniatures or card or whatever. Um, board war game board board games are 
real popular now. So mo most of the stores around here are certainly pretty good with those. The, the, the local game store is a, an independent local business, right? And we should always support independent local businesses. And in almost every case, they will special order you stuff um, instead of, you know, ordering it from online somewhere. Now you can get better prices online, let's face it. So, but I, you know, try to make a point to go to the local game store instead of giving, you know, Jeff Bezos all my money, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even like the online retailers of war games are independent, relative, pretty small businesses, right? Yes. So when we're talking about the people I've ordered from, so cool stuff is like the biggest one, I guess, and they're not that big. Um, uh, miniature market nws is one guy and uh, enterprise West. games is is uh you know is is uh i just people. want to check out enterprise games he's so, got some, he's got some good prices man yes he does yes he does you gotta check you gotta like click on the thing and then check inventory and stock though sometimes yeah, it's i know like i got screwed list. so many times i'm buying this buying that buying this check out <laughs> zero 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 what the hell well that was that was it was practically free <laughs> almost so the, the best game stores that I am aware of are the Gamers Armory in North Carolina, which I've seen pictures of. It's pretty impressive. Um, there's, I mean, and domestically, right? There's like that store in Russia that that's, looks cool, but it's in Russia. So you're not driving there this weekend. What store? I forget what it's called, but because its name is in Russian. <laughs> but there's a store uh, run by Igor Lukniev that who that's he's in Moscow and he runs a war game store in Moscow. And it's it's a lucrative store, like it's a big oh, thing. I have no idea if he's oh. making a living at that or not. I know okay. there's a store. I've seen pictures of it. Um, there's uh, so Gamers Armory in North Carolina. Uh, Enterprise Games I don't think operates a physical storefront. Noble Knight does, but. Uh, they don't have like everything in on the shelf. Like it, it, they have a ware huge warehouse. They're they're in Madison, Wisconsin, and they have like an attached warehouse. And you can ask, say, "Hey, I found this thing on the web page. It says you have it. Can you check?" And they'll go get it for you. Wow, that's cool. Their prices tend to be high, but um, or on the high side, but they're not always high. And uh, the people there are really really good. Um, I have had nothing but but glowing personal experiences with Yobel Knight, either buying stuff from them on the internet or when we walked in, uh, it was fantastic. So you're talking about think, Noble Knight, eh? Yeah. Noble Knight in Madison, Wisconsin or a suburb of Madison, Wisconsin. Something yeah. like that. Um, I've heard about games plus and Mount prospect, which beat cake, beat cake, men beat whatever his name is beat mentions cat, here. Hey. <laughs> Beefcake. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I think when I say there's a great game store in Chicago, I believe it's that store that I'm thinking of. And what's it called? Games Plus. And their their selection looks good, too. There's also this Complete Strategist, which I believe has two locations, one in New York City. Don't ask me how that stays open. And like it's like in the middle of Manhattan. And I know, I know. King of Prussia, PA, which is a fabulous place to put a war game store. Um, See, I don't know these bloody places, man. We have but I've only seen pictures of the New York location. There was years and years and years ago. There was actually a complete strategist in Ohio, but that was when I was like twelve. So, you know, I got all stupid and wistful. I ordered a game, and it was called Alpha Omega. I remember that from an Avalon old Hill. Avalon game. Anyways, it came mm -hmm. in. It was a beat beat up, missing two pieces, but I got it for ten bucks. Oh, okay, ten bucks. You know, seventy dollars to ship it. Uh, no, it was shipped from uh, Nova Scotia, Canada, so it was fifteen dollars to ship. Okay, so it came with some fish. Whatever. <laughs> and uh, wait, hold on. You want I, 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 whatever? Um, and I picked up the catalog. You know, mm -hmm. the, the Avalon Hill catalog, because the guy had everything in there. Mm -hmm. And it was May first, nineteen eighty-two, and May second is my birthday. Please don't forget it, Artie. Uh, and, that'll uh, be easy to remember because mine's on May fifth. No so, way. Mm -hmm. Cinco de Mayo. So every every year I fail to take advantage of my natural excuse to get all buttered up on tequila. <laughs> so no wonder we get along. You're a pure Taurus. Man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Bullheaded sons of bitches. That's the best. <laughs> Anyways, what was I saying before you so rudely interrupted me? So, what was I saying? 
I don't know what you're no, saying. No, really. What was I saying? You you got Alpha Omega and was missing pieces. Oh yeah, then and I got you were looking wistful. through the catalog. Yeah, and I got all wistful, and I was like, "Man, I was 17 years old, man." And I'm like, "Freak me! What was I doing? I was 17. I can't even say it on on on, on the air that what was I doing." But anyways, <laughs> and um, yeah, or the Canadian equivalent of the FBI will come knocking at your door tomorrow. And you know what's another good subject? Because I know you have a subject in mind for uh, your house next week. I'm sure but we'll come up with something. I, I, I'd like to do, why do we collect? Why do we collect? Well, good question. We can talk about that next week. What do you, do you, is it, I mean. No, no, I was why, gonna... do, why, why do we collect? Like why, I mean, I know why I collect. So I, I don't Think of myself as a collector, even though I have a natural tendency to try to be a completionist. Yeah. Try and like get I, I like so. Let's take OCS as the obvious example because I talk about yeah. it a lot, right? So I have all but I think four of the OCS games at this point, and three of those OCS games are the like the first three OCS games, right? I don't need any of those. The first one's obsolete. The second yeah, one's our, obsolete. The our, third one's about to be obsolete. You gotta finish this. You gotta finish the collection. Uh, no, I'm okay with not actually. I, I'm not. I don't need to run those down. I, there's, there, <laughs> they, they, I wouldn't play them. Um, now, the one series where I did actually go out of my little bit out of my way, not far out of my way, to go like get the old versions to was the Great Campaigns of the American Civil War. Partly that's because the Avalon Hill game the games that Avalon Hill did back in the day several of them are pretty inexpensive and I had the expensive ones so uh which have not been reprinted at least not yet and that's that's of course why they're expensive so so I did actually run those down though that's like the only like complete collection of any game series that I have pretty sure that's with more than a couple things in it, let me put it that way. I've got all the Mike Resch nineteen fourteen games, but there's only three of those, so it's like cheating to mention that. You know, I was I was talking to uh, I was talking to Robert Carroll. He's got um, a YouTube channel called Kilroy Was Here, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a fine channel to which you should all be subscribed. I, I enjoy his stuff. I mean, I have him do stuff on my channel. I, I love his stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's got like five thousand games. I don't have five thousand games. I'll tell you that. I, I don't have close to. I'm I'm actually buttoned up against, and I've slowed down quite a bit. So, like in the first so far, twenty twenty one, it might not seem like it. Uh, I'm buttoned up against three hundred war games, and boy, that's a lot. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's having dumps. I I probably dumped twenty games in the last year okay, that, so that came out of my stuff. You're not a collector at all, man. Uh, I mean, I, like I said, I have the instinct to do it, to try it. If I really like a series, to get them all. I mean, there's a couple series that I really like that I'm missing one or two. The uh, Library of Napoleonic Battles, for example. I'm missing two games in that series. And, you know, I'm unwilling to pay the market price for them. So I will wait until they either get reprinted, which might never happen, or um, I'll see them at a price I want to pay, or... If I don't, I don't. I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't want to pay two hundred dollars for the coming storm. Um, Dune, Dune was reprinted by uh, Force Gale Nine. <clears throat> yeah, Force Nine. Yeah, it's it's the, exactly the same game with different graphics. Now, did did the price go down of the old Avalon Hill one? Yes, precipitously. You're serious? Yes, I've seen now. Not right away because people are still trying to poach for you know a hundred and fifty dollar game. They're still trying to get that price. But like a year later, like now, those are going for twenty or thirty dollars. The old, the old doom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's not to say if you look at three hundred bucks, man. That's not to say if you look at eBay, there's not some idiot still trying to get two hundred dollars for it. But that that person is not selling their copy. So, uh, that, well, I didn't care though. So I mean, I it, it does. I mean, I like Avalon Hill. I'm a fan of Avalon Hill, yeah, but it didn't fan. bother me to not have the Avalon Hill version. I'm happy with the Guild Force Nine version. It's a great game, by the way. I I, I um. I, I don't like those games because I don't like to um, deceive you. I don't like it at all. Oh, you'd hate that then. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's a cosmic diplomacy. encounter. Cosmic encounter. Cosmic encounters like that too. Yeah, forget in it, fact, forget it. I think the guy, uh, at least one of the designers of Cosmic Encounter, was one of the designers of Dune as well. I I believe. Uh, um, okay. Okay. Which makes a lot of sense. There's a, there's definitely a kindred. They're not really mechanically similar, but there's definitely 
similarities in approach between those two games. And I, I like Cosmic Encounter too. I've played it twice, and the last time I played it was in about 1998. No, so I, I played it with a, a co-worker of mine who's a friend of mine, <clears throat> and I and I just I totally duped him. I said, let me go in my acting mode. And I said, man, look, I'll align with you and we'll crush uh, everybody. <clears throat> and I just stabbed him in the face. <laughs> in the true diplomacy. But hold, on. <laughs> but hold on a second. <clears throat> in real life, I lost a little bit of his trust. That's why you shouldn't play those games with your friends. You should play <laughs> those games right. at conventions with people that you don't know. Because I duped them so good. Now, I like so to play good. RPGs with my friends. I like to play games like Diplomacy or Cosmic Encounter with people I don't know at a convention. <sighs> I can't. It's personal. John, I'm going to mail you a box of all the dog poop I've been saving up. <laughs> so. Uh, Jesus, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, and, and Wow, that's another good topic. Uh, but hold on. What dog the poop? Fred, Fred, Fred said something here. Uh, where is Omo Luden? Oh, yeah. Here he goes. So I agree with Fred on this completely. Um, there's certainly like cl let's let's take an example. Okay, um, can I say something to Fred before I? Uh, oh no, go ahead. Well, I well, well I come up with an example. Go ahead. Putain de merde, de de de, de connard, de 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 de, de putain. That's all. I, I have no idea what that was. Yeah, I just told about, them, please call me back right away. Today. I I thought you said, uh, please. I am going to send you all my poutine. No, that's no. what I heard. No, but. it was it was a no. It was <laughs> French from France. We don't understand it here. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> they uh, oh, I uh, mortified. I was ta I was talking on Twitter to uh, Morgan Guton Reti, and uh, she was like appalled at the very notion of poutine being like French from France. No, she, she was like oh, was horrified that you would that people like human people would do such a thing as to. Have fries and put gravy and cheese curds on. Like, Mortified. Whatever. Whatever. Anyway, on, you were saying something. Uh, right. So that. let's say uh, Squad Leader is a bad example because it stayed in print, right? Um, let's the classic Avalon Hill game. Um, diplomacy is a great example. Okay. So what happens if diplomacy? You know, it's an all-time classic game. That that is, you know, to what extent it's a war game? You you pick. But it's it's an Avalon Hill game. It's got war game pedigree, even if it's not a war game itself. And I'm picking it just because it's got a, a big appeal and it's enduringly popular. What if Hasbro decided they weren't going to reprint it and it had been on print for 30 years? Doesn't diplomacy or whatever game you want to pick as an example deserve to remain in print? I think it does. And even if I don't like it, I'm I'm not a big diplomacy fan because for the reason I said I don't like to play that kind of game with with my friends. Um, so I, I prefer that games remain available because they should if they're good games they should remain available. Yeah. Sometimes they're expensive and and war games can have a tendency to be large and very expensive. I mean, certainly you have your somebody's talking about Case Blue. Uh, case the case blues and I mean, is he right about that? Is they couldn't give away case that's, blues? That's the story out of Multi Man. They that they had a decent number of copies that lingered in the warehouse, presumably because they were expensive. I don't know what it retailed for back in the day. Probably like seventy five <laughs> bucks back then. Eh, probably, I think it was. I, I completely guessing. I want to say it was about one fifty, which at the time I'm sure seemed like an absurd price. I remember when Second Front came out, the Europa Second Front, and it was a hundred dollars, and no one had ever heard of a game that expensive before. It was it was it was terrifying, and of course I didn't buy it. And now it goes for three or four hundred. Yeah. But so I mean, I I just assume games stay in print. I agree completely. Well, well who's going to fund a good it? game? Well, Artie, who's going to fund it? The the Ardwolf Foundation. Well, yeah, you see, that's the thing. So, I mean, companies have to pay taxes on their inventory, right? There used to be some kind of way to write that off. So you'd basically pay pennies on the dollar for, like, inventory that was sitting in a warehouse. You can't do that anymore. That was a law change, U.S. law change that happened. And as a result, pretty much nobody keeps everything in print anymore. There, there are very rare exceptions to that. Palladium Books pretty much keeps everything in print. Now they've got some super ancient stuff that's not in print, but 
like see, uh, the fa that Pharaoh's game, for example. Like online and print? PDF? No, no, they could buy, like, you could go order physical copies of them. Uh, how they are still in business for a plethora of reasons um, is beyond me. See, 250, that's, not, I mean, it's an enormous game, so that could, <laughs> that could have been the retail. So... Uh, that you can't be nice to an old print. That's one night, one way to be nice. So it's actually people. not true that OCS games don't get reprinted. Um, often when they are reprinted, however, they are revised enough that you get a Roman numeral after it. So you have Tunisia 2, for example. Burma 2 doesn't have a Roman numeral on it, and there's not that many differences in the game. The box looks different. Korea's been reprinted. Sicily got redone. So it's not true to say that OCS games don't get reprinted. I think it's super unlikely that Case Blue will ever get reprinted, in part just because it's so big. Well, did, he, we, say that, did he say that MMP had it in stock? No, it's not in stock. It hasn't oh. been in stock in years. It might still be listed on their website. I don't know. I haven't looked at that because I know it's not there. They don't have any. Uh, but I can tell you that some months ago, before they had their, oh, we found it in the warehouse sale, they did find like two copies of Case Blue, or, or at least they found component enough components to assemble two complete Ziploc copies of Case Blue, and I think they raffled them off or something like that. So that may have been what that price was. I have no idea. It was a 2007 release, I think, and I don't know what. Like I said, I don't want to guess to say what. The, and I don't. Now I'm not getting it off the shelf, so I don't think the price is on the box anyway. Now, uh, uh, Artie, uh, Case Blue, um, ha have you played that multiple times? No, I've played it once. It was my first OCS game, which is dumb. But Oh, yeah? Because uh, it's so big. I mean, you're like completely, well, I was, it was only a four-player game, right? I had a, a bewildering array of stuff. I had no idea what I was doing. Holy cow. Um, so, I mean, it was still fun. We had fun with it. I'm still playing OCS. Yeah, so and that was five or six years ago now, something like that. Maybe seven. Um, but no, I've only played it once. It's because it's a it's a giant project, right? It's it's the biggest OCS project to play. Seriously. Yeah, I mean, it's 10 maps and 12 or 14 counter sheets or something like that. You know, I'll tell you for 150 bucks when it came out, that was a steal. Uh, yeah, I mean, in retrospect, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've, I've seen recently, in the last six months, shrink wrap copies of Case Blue sell for six hundred dollars. So, did you, did you see it sell? Like, was it sold? Sell, sell, yes, sell. Oh, now, this God. is on the Facebook thing, on the Facebook Concept Marketplace group, where stuff actually sells, and I keep an eye on this stuff. Six I mean, sometimes I'll, sometimes if I see something on eBay that looks interesting, I'll like. Put I like bookmark it just so I can keep an eye on it because I'm interested in what it goes for. Yeah, somebody was selling what looked to me like a nearly complete set of Europa games. I, and I, saw, until, that. I saw that up until like the like an hour and a half before it's the auction was over, it was going for like two fifteen or something like that. And then I checked on it like the next. Of course, I forgot about it because I wasn't in the market and I knew it was going to go way up. It went for like twenty one hundred dollars. Oh I God. saw the, the next day, but I mean, it's like you know, you got all these boxes and like a huge trash bag full of counters, right? So, it uh, you know, what's there, what's missing, God only knows. But it's you know, the individual games go for one, two, three hundred dollars sometimes. So, it's like uh, Peter. It's like twenty five year old scotch, huh? Well, th that's why I stopped drinking because. Maybe. My thirty-year-olds, thirty-year-olds went like this. Uh, stop! <laughs> I can't drink that. Sorry. Too expensive. So yeah. So I mean, I, I just assume things stay in print. I, I think eventually, what we will end up with. Th this might happen, you know, five, ten, twenty years from now, or it might never happen, and I'm just full of crap. I think what we will probably eventually see with a lot of kinds of games, probably including war games, is a strict print-on-demand model where, you know, there's some advanced version of Blue Panther, for example, that yeah, is yeah, printing yeah. on printing case blue on demand, 30, you know, in 2051. Um, and you order it for whatever it costs, you know, $2.6 million that it costs, and they ship and they print it and ship it to you. 
Well, I that's think that's ultimately is. where we're going. Well, a, look, as I, a game industry, game hobby in general, not just war games. Well, I I know that when uh, <clears throat> Compass Games, I don't know what other company I was talking to, probably Flying Pig too, man. Um, as soon as they get two hundred and fifty copies, now they print. That was unheard of ten years ago. You don't print two hundred and fifty copies, man. Are you kidding? You're going well, in for a loss. So the, 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 the economy of scale is a, a huge factor. And people s complain about, I, I, the, for some reason, they complain to me. I don't know why. So people complain mm -hmm. about pricing from, say, Decision or Compass or MMB yeah, yeah. or whoever. And it's, you know, a huge part of that is the fact that, that they're printing print runs that are like a half or or a quarter or a tenth of the size of, say, a GMT print run. I need to they're paying three or four times as much to print it mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. um, now, what those exact numbers look like today, I don't know. That's something I haven't been involved with in a long time. You know, Ragnar Simulations is actually doing a decent amount. I, I don't know if you'd call it print on demand, but they do their stuff largely in-house, right? They buy blank boxes and put stickers on them, and they are the, their counters are clearly like made in at home. Um, and I think they encourage you to buy to just get the PDF versions of the rules in front of yourself, which is another thing I think um, more companies are probably going to do is not put rules in the box. Is say it's on our website, print it, download it, and print it yourself. I think more companies are probably going to start doing that. Oh uh, no, that's cool. That's cool. It's too bad because. Um, that's one of the reasons why I like collecting, and I know I'm going off the bloody train again, is because it's tactile. It's a tactile experience. Oh yeah. Like I said, it, it brought me back to 1982 when I thought I was 17. What was I doing when I was 17? This, yeah. is, this is a bloody game. That did you circle that. all the other games in the catalog that you wanted? <laughs> well, well, not this one. But when <laughs> when I bought my first Panzer League back yeah. in the day, yeah. I mean, I did stuff like that too. Um, yeah. I always always was interested in the longest day. I think more fascinated by its sheer size than anything else. And to this day, I've still never personally handled a copy. I don't think. Um, and I no. think it's a game that's probably not super worth. I, I think it's a game that probably doesn't hold up very well today. Let me now. Uh, um, in your experience, already a game, an old Avalon Hill game. Let's say like a. Uh, submarine, uh, the longest day. The, what you're talking about? Do mm -hmm. they suck in comparison to the games of today? You know what I mean? Sub, yeah, suck, suck, suck like isn't the, the word God. I would use necessarily. And I don't know anything about the the Avalon Hill submarine games. What I will here's here's what I'll um, use as an example is Fortress Europa. Okay, so it's pretty much the it's sort of anyway. It's sort of an attempt to do Russian campaign on the West Front, right? It's Start with the D-Day landings and go to the end of the war type of thing. And I think it's a pretty good game. I think it holds up okay now, but there are it, it also takes 30 hours to play. And I think there's there's games now with much cleaner designs that do exactly the same things. There's multiple ones. There's the Mighty Endeavor, there's that one from those French guys that I, I they might be Hexasim, uh, Liberty Road, I think, um, that play in half or a quarter of the amount of time and pretty much give you the same experience. And does, 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 um, and that's, that's a thing that Avalon Hill was bad at, was at managing play time on some, uh, on a lot of games that were a lot like, uh, Age of Renaissance or History of the World or even those like general interest games that they did like that. You sit down and play those games now and you're like, this is okay, but man, it, we took it took like nine hours to play this thing. Ah. This is a this should be a two hour game and it's not. Uh, Victory in the Pacific is like that. It takes way too long. It's, it's like a six to eight hour game and there's no way it should take that long. Victory in the Pacific, that's a... And it's a great game. Uh, well, but it, it takes longer to play than it should, and it takes longer to play than a modern design on that same topic at the same scale would would take. Who is that? Avalon Hill. Uh, and do you think? And does does um get uh, the the prettiness of the quality make a difference for you? The what? Oh, uh, uh, what am I trying yeah, to say? Like the like the. 
the, the shininess of the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have different counters, you know, like because when you get an old Avalon Hill game, it's just like number two written on it kind of thing, you know? And uh, Well, yeah, I mean, I, I like nice-looking components, but I, I also have relatively old-fashioned tastes. So as long as – I mean, I'm perfectly fine with, like, old as mid-'70s SPI counters as long as, like, the, they don't have actual functional problems like the print's too small for me to read or something like that. Yeah. That doesn't particularly bother me. A lot of people like this new – a lot of publishers that I won't name today uh, tend to have this sort of oversaturate – this very highly sat – high saturation art style on their maps, for example. Mm -hmm. which is very different from like classic war oh, game maps. Absolutely. Most of which is like, you know, the stuff GMT is doing now are still those sort no, of no, old fashioned no, looking no, maps. No, I no, like no. the old fashioned looking ones better generally. Well, hold, hold on. What, what's wrong with naming the companies? We're not bashing it. You're just, you're just stating an opinion. Maybe they have a reason for doing that. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. No, I don't think so. I think it's just the art style that they picked and it sounded good at the time. Uh, the, so I'll, I'll name a game specifically. Company co Is it Company of Heroes or Conflict of Heroes from Academy Games? Yes. Um, I had trouble distinguishing where the hexes were on the, on the Guadalcanal maps. Uh, oh, so, because of the grass and all that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah or the, the jungle, right, is where I was having that problem. Right, right. And that's right. not that that's the only game of by the only publisher that has had similar problems. There's a uh, balance of powers from Compass has like, the hex color is way the uh, the color of the hex grid is way too close to the color that is Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's very difficult. To, very easy absolutely to get lost in Russia. I mean, how can you shade the color as you're going down? Type thing of just the hexes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's ways to do it, right? You you have a black hex grid out on a relatively subdued map palette, and there you go. And that's the traditional approach. The um. But it doesn't have to be that. I mean, you could do the opposite that the gamers did sometimes where they'd have a white hex grid on a super highly saturated thing. You never had any trouble telling where the hexes were, and it, the map overall was absolutely ghastly. So I'm, I'm talking there about the Brigade Combat series, which is a well-regarded series, but, man, a lot of the maps are hideous. Um, Spirit Wolf, and I hate to say that this name here, but uh, I'm going to say Gobbles because, uh, you know, look at that. This, that's very close to Goebbels, and you have a last name, Megale. No, no? relate, no relation. <laughs> so, um, my yeah. last name is actually Dutch. In in my case, what is a Mengel? It's Meng. It's Mengel. Yeah, but we've been Mengel. here for two hundred fifty years too, so it's yeah, Mengel. You're still Dutch. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So, I mean, there's German too, but Mengel, the Mengel line came from from the Dutch. So, um, I mean, I, I like a lot of those old Avalon Hill games, too. And it was it occurred to me just like the other day because my buddy said, oh, I got a copy of Conquistador for you. I was looking for one. And it occurred to me, man, I actually have kind of a lot of Avalon Hill games now at this point. I mean, I, I was down Avalon. at one point to having about seven or eight, I think. But now I have quite a few Avalon Hill games. Um, and I, I, I'm completely okay with that. Not yeah. all of the, them necessarily. So... I can say that few of them would be considered state-of-the-art game designs right now, but that doesn't mean they're not playable, um, and it doesn't mean they're not fun or good. Um, I don't care if it's a state-of-the-art game as long as it's cool to play. I mean, that's the more important thing, right? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, mean I, I have I could complain about their component quality all day. The aesthetics. But, that was the word. Aesthetics. Look yeah. at that bloody hell. No. I have serious, serious, serious problems with Avalon Hill's die cutting. Um, which was often, not always, but often really shabby. And skewed. That happens sometimes too. I've seen I've seen worse examples from SPI of registration, like registration problems that would result in the whole counter sheet going in the garbage than from Avalon Hill. And you gotta be worried about that. If you buy like a shrink wrap game off of eBay or something like that, you, you don't you don't know. You can't call SPI up and get a new counter sheet. So you never know what you're gonna get. I know. And and is there such a thing as unshrinking it, taking a look at the game and shrinking it up again? Yes, that's called shifty. <laughs> um, one of the local game stores, the Soldiery, re-shrink wraps games. And they, they tell you that they do it. They're not trying trying to be sneaky right, right. about it. And right. they do it so that you can't open the game up in the store with loose counters and the counters go all over the place. You put it back in the shelf. So there's a reason why they do it. But, you know, they need... If you're doing that, you need to communicate to people the condition of the parts inside, right? Uh, okay, so let's say you were selling a rewrap game. You'll sell. Mm -hmm. you'll, you could say 
mint rewrapped. I would I would give details about it. That's why I did it on video so I could show people what the things look like inside. Yeah, I, know. Um, I would give details about it. Uh, is it unpunched? Is it punched? Is it punched but verified that every counter is there? Um, are is there any are there any wear problems on the components? Highlighting on the rule book, underlining somebody put their name on the front cover, anything like that. I would I would if I were selling. A, a re shrink wrapped game, and I don't have a shrink wrap machine. Who that? Who the hell has? Yeah, that? I know, I know, I am. Um, but if I was doing that, as long as I was telling people, you know, here's the details. It's a re shrink just to just to protect it. But here's the details of the inside, and then if if they have a problem with that after they get the game and open it up, then they can call me and complain, and I'll give them their money back, right? So. I'm just a lot of to, people like mounted maps. I'm um, trying to stir up some shit here. I think mounted maps are here's here's some stirring for you. I think mounted maps are overrated. I love mounted maps. I mean, notionally, I like mounted maps too, but a lot of times they do warp. A lot of the Avalon Hill boards actually it depends. Uh, so they had a couple of different styles over the lifespan of Avalon Hill of mounted boards. For example, the, the type of mounted board that they had in Trireme, I think Trireme, or Freedom in the Galaxy was like a different style than like the squad leader mounted boards. Those tended to warp very, very easily. Um, I don't like those. It's one reason why I ran down a game that I put away, the SPI Freedom in the Galaxy, which has an unmounted map, but I put Plexi on it. So who cares, right? So I, you know, it's like you get a new game from GMT. It's got a nice, pretty mounted map, and the whole thing is all pooch, pooched up, and you got to sit there and stack stuff on it. Sometimes they end up putting plexi on it anyway. Okay, okay, just to uh, keep it flat. I, uh, I understand. I yes. get it. I get it. I like the the idea I, of a mounted map. I want a mounted map. I want a. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I was stupid enough at Noble Knight to order two copies of. The mounted map for RAF. Huh? Okay. That's how much I like mounted maps. Subconsciously, I got two. You could have just got the new version of RAF that has the mounted map. Yeah, for, for 90 bucks. Oh, that's one that's another thing. Hold on. <clears throat> um, I love a lot of decision games stuff. I got Joe Miranda Struggle for Galactic Empire. I really, that's a pretty cool game. I, I, I like that game that. too. I it, very Isaac Asimov. Very Look. Yes, I, I just love it. And and uh, what the hell was I gonna say? Yeah, and decision games, um, ninety dollars RAF. Okay, look, it's when I'm thinking of a RAF, John Butterfield. I'm mm -hmm. sure they paid an extra to have John Butterfield do a game for well, decision. Yeah, maybe. I mean, they've they've had that game for well over two, two for what twenty years. I mean, the original oh, yeah. was from West End Games. That's uh, right. And, and they, they have been printing RAF for, uh, for a long time. So it's, I don't know that they gave John Butterfield any extra juice. Maybe they did. Okay. Who knows? All right. Well, but, well, that, well you, and I said, and I was going to say 90 bucks US plus shipping. I factor all that in. But you know what? 90 bucks for a game like that, it's three games in one. You, it get, is. A mounted, you get a mounted map, and it's, it, it's a John Butterfield design. So That's, you know what? Yeah. And I will, I will absolutely st say, if you have issues with the decision games and the way they do things, I think the John, any John Butterfield game that they produce is worth your time. Of course, I buy it all right off the bat. So, I mean, you know, and it's funny because I was, I used to harp on on Compass Games and the shoddiness of of their the the quality, <clears throat> and then I I, I um. I listened to Bill, the guy who owns the company, with John Krantz, mm -hmm. and he explained it <clears throat> that sometimes mistakes do happen, whatever, whatever. But he, and we we were discussing why his games are so expensive. Well, they're printed in the states, man. Uh, so yeah, you'll You're notice now. That, period. You'll, you'll notice that now some of those games aren't printed in the states anymore, and the prices are quite a bit lower. So, um, yes, at the time that I think Bill had that discussion, I think they, they were printing virtually everything in the States. No. Um, but, well, the, the mounted map stuff, and this is what Bill told me at the time, was, was the mounted maps were not feasible to get printed in the States. Okay. So if it had a mounted map, it got printed in China. But if it had a non-mounted map, it got printed here. And I, I think that's probably still true. But the stuff with the mounted maps... 
is the prices on the recent releases are comparatively lower than they used to be. But the look at the size. I mean, what was the size of the print run? That's the biggest factor, right? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so if they're that's printing three hundred, co- I'm sure it was more than three hundred copies. But they're you know they're printing a thousand copies of something where GMT can print eight thousand copies of some Hex Encounter War game. That, uh, that makes a huge difference. Compass has got cash, man. Uh, trust me. Look well, at you know, the, and and they're you know they have they have. I think been aware of the issues and are working harder than some other publishers to address Absolutely. their component quality issues that they have had. And and they have had, just talking strictly about component quality, bluntly, they have had some component quality problems. Well, yeah. Some, I mean, some of the complaints, I think, are not well-founded, but some of them are. So, Oh, no, no. And, and you know what? And I'm sure Bill and John would totally agree with us. And, and as a matter of fact, when I got... Um, John Butterfield's uh, game that he did for Shenandoah Studios, uh, Battle of the Bulge. Uh, the, the World War II commander. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like called, I, I it, anyways, it was John Butterfield, and I just bought it blindly, right? Sure. And when I got the game. I've played that on the computer game yeah. version. It's 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 fine. It's hey, 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 hey. John Butterfield. Yeah. And um, when I got the game, this was very good quality game, and the components were solid. The box was solid, and... It's completely changed, man. Even I the combat, say even I the saw, combat series. I want to say I saw a pre, a proof copy of that game at Compass Expo in 2019, and it looked good to me at the time. But in one? terms of component quality, the the Butterfield one. Yeah. Oh, now man. I had the I got the video game version. I don't need the I don't need the 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 board game version. Yeah, but I'm a... I, I thought the components were nice. I thought the components for the Mark Herman France 1944 were nice too. So people complain about that it. too. I didn't see it. But this game here, the, the, the combat game, this was actually gifted to me by, by um a viewer of mine, which is unbelievable. It's it's a hundred bucks, mm-hmm. and it's the uh they say it's like an ambush game, man. I haven't even played yeah, it. Yeah, I've heard good things. I've heard there's been complaints about it for various things, but the big problem was a I think some misprinted counter sheets that Compass immediately fixed and shipped out to okay. replacements to everybody. Uh, I, there's some people that really, really like that game. I'm not in the market for a like tactical World War II solid. Yeah, you're not. Game. Yeah, yeah. That's just not my thing. But there's people that really like that game. Yeah, yeah. Um, I even ordered this the the uh, the expansion to this because. Uh, the game oh. John Longshore is talking about might be triplanetary. Old oh. GDW game. Uh, re- relatively recently republished by Steve Jackson Games. They've had Steve Jackson has had the rights for decades. <laughs> there you go. That's the that's the fancy new version. It's supposed to be good. I've never played it. Neither I sold I. my copy years and years ago. Came with a grease pencil, actually. It's still there. It's still there, the grease pencil, man. Mm-hmm. Okay, so look, Artie, let's talk about, because we always go off, let's talk about, uh, if, if you don't mind, about collecting and, and, and sure. uh, what the hell, because we're going to go off anyways, you know, and next week. Next week, it's at your house, eh? Sure. My, my channel, next week, we'll do collecting war games and the foibles thereafter. I mean, I, I will tell you, as a, I guess, a preview of the topic, that if I am not interested in a game, I'm not going to collect it, <laughs> Right. I mean, I collect, and I suspect this is true for everybody that you would ask, is they, you collect the games that you're interested in, yeah. even if you don't necessarily know you're going to play it. There's people that don't do that, by the way. Um, there are people that just buy it all, even though they know they're never going to play it. And I'm, I I'm guess becoming that's, that. I'm that's becoming senseless. That. I might be fooling myself sometimes when I say, oh, I'm gonna, definitely going to play this, and it never happens, and 10 years later I sell it. That That does happen. But I never go into buying it with the assumption that I'm never going to play that. That's oh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't have that kind of money. Well, no, but I did that for one game, and I was supposed to get it at six ten today, and I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Um, boy. And I spent what? Well, I think it was ninety Canadian, which was a pretty good price for the blue box squad leader. The blue box, the purple box. Yeah. Okay. Uh, unpunched. Are you kidding? With the box ripped, even uh, that's expensive. I mean, that, that's what about uh, 60 bucks, 60 70 bucks US. 
I mean, I guess that's not too bad a price. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay that for. I did, but I don't, I don't see any reason to step back to old squad leader either. So no, I know it's just I wanted to have it, and uh, it's got yeah. a great box cover. I'll tell you that iconic yeah. box cover. Great, Ooh, is that great. Is that I want to say that was a Mark uh, Roger McGowan cover. I, I might be wrong about that, but I think it was. You know, Matt, we we gotta have Roger McGowan on. I keep, I keep asking him. To Roger McGowan. Born May 5th. No way. Yep. He shares my birthday. You know, he's putting out a book, huh? Of all oh, his. Oh, he is? Yeah. Like that a... would be, if I had like a real war room here, I would totally buy those, like those poster sheets of box covers from him and put them all over the place. Like yeah, uh, Kyle I'll... Seeley has. That would be fantastic. You know what I did huh? at WBC in a drunken stupor? <clears throat> uh, it was the end of, the, it was the end of the show and they wanted to change all their, um, all their cardboard cards where they had all the game, the game posters. Mm -hmm. I took them all. Oh boy, oh boy, they're pretty cool. Yeah, you can they order are. them from the C three I Op Center website. They're not terribly expensive. My they're Panzer iconic Blitz. covers. My Panzer Blitz. That's where I got it from. Mm -hmm. Anyways, was was that a Roger McGowan cover or was that a Redmond Simonson? Redmond cover? Simonson. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, Redmond Simonson, the late great Redmond Simonson, was a graphics genius, Name considering Mike. he had like caveman level tools to work with in the seventies, and he did amazing work. I know, I know. I mean, Roger McGowan, uh, like I said, he's putting out a coffee table book. He's working on that now, and uh, you know what? You're gonna regret it if you don't buy it. Probably. Won't be the first time. Yeah, and I'm gonna have to charge you five bucks a page to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Artie. Hey. All right. So it sounds like next week uh, you got your show on Saturday. Uh, what else do you have coming? Oh, I'm trying to do that, Fred. I'm, I'm gonna do Ace of Aces with Fred, but we got to work it out. I wanted to do like an RPG, uh, like. RPG on his side, RPG on my side of our character, and not too long, you know, I'm sure they're going to die off of Ace of Aces. And other than that, uh, other than that, it goes to um, San Diego Historicon mm -hmm. the 19th of May. Right. What about so you? So, I've actually, uh, the, the last time that happened was like in the middle of what me moving, and it was just hopeless. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't able to All do right. it. So hopefully I'll be doing something there. Next week is the Connections Online Conference, which is a uh, semi. It, it, it's it's a conference that involves uh, professional war gamers with the military, um, as well as hobby people as well. You can, can check you that out. Some, can you send me some info on that, please? I will send you some info on that for the for the news show. Yeah, but you go to the Armchair Dragoons website, and there's it's linked off of there. Um, and they have a very aggressive schedule, like a four. It's like a three or four day event, like Monday through Wednesday or something like that. So I'll be doing that next week, and then okay. uh, I've got, of course, an unboxing video this week. I don't even remember what it is. Silent Victory, I think. Nah, Spirit Wolf. I don't know who's gonna who's gonna do it. Might just be Roger. Uh, I I, I guess. I Maybe. guess. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. So because because I mean, um, he's got a lot of work. He did a lot of work in his oh, life yeah. on this guy. Yeah, Bloody uh, hell. A lot of iconic war game covers. Oh, man. You know, I'm, I'm an, I mean, almost a lot of my favorite war game covers of all time of games in some cases that I've never played. There's a Iron Bottom Sound. That's a fantastic cover. I have no, ne, never even seen a copy of that in person. And talking about Iron Bottom, Mike Bertuccelli is here. Mike, you're still here because I just saw your graphic of, of, of the game you just put out. Oh my God! What was it called? Wolf Wolf Pack or something? Uh, what game is that? Is, out? is that is it, is there is a game called Wolf Pack coming from GMT? Or are we talking about Atlantic Chase, which just came out? Which I no, but that's a Jeremy White game. Yes, correct. Yeah, great cover, and the same sure. thing with with uh, Mike Bertuccelli's cover. Really nice, really nice. Anyways, thanks people for showing up. Artie, thanks. Have a good. All right. day. Next Have a good rest of the weekend. Next Wednesday at Art Wolf's Lair, I'll put a thing out for it. All right, man. Maybe we'll stick to the subject. That would be very unlikely, but we could <laughs> we can always dream. 
Yeah, it's Wolf Pack. Wolf Pack. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. what I said. Did, did I say that? I thought I said that. Yeah. What's this? Hold on a second. What's he saying? It's just a plate. Of... That's not going to be the cover. Hmm. Mike, can you tell us who the artist is? Is it uh, Caridis? Uh, Antonis Caridis? The, the guy who did the uh, wing leader for uh, Lee Brimicum Wood? Look at that. Look at me rattling off names. You see, um, you're getting good at this. That, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't I, know. I don't know who Lee's cover artist is. Yeah, it's Antoni, uh, Antonis Caridis. <laughs> I'm telling you. Oh, Terry Leeds. Okay. All right. Terry That's Leeds has fun. done some really good work. I've only seen like three or four things that he's done. But but everything I've seen that he has done has been very impressive. Well, I, I'm, I'm, Mike, I'm glad you're here. Um, I don't know if you ever go to WBC, but I wanted to do a huge, if this can happen, a huge tank battle with Tank Duel. Like I don't know if that I don't know how we can work that out. I know Mark Herman's in, John Butterfield's in. These guys all wanted to play it before COVID, so uh, I don't know. Maybe yeah, like like Battle of the Network Stars. It's going to be great. No, but I mean, you could do the Battle of Kursk or something. You oh, know, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know I what suppose. I'm saying? I get, two, get okay. two, all four thousand people that are at the event to, to play. I suppose. All right, let me let me let me uh, go out here. How do I go out? Do I go out? There's a button. It's on your your you have the button. Okay, already stick around. Ciao, people.